Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. I'm Kevin Graham. And I'm Colin Watt. This week, we'll be speaking about the eight in a row dream team. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at Celtic Park and had an interesting discussion with the gentleman sitting to my left about the team we could have assembled within the last eight years from the eight in a row era. Now, Colin, recently you've done a few polls on a Celtic state of mind in yep. terms of Celtic cult heroes. These are going to be looking at a team of the decade all the way up to the present day. So this will be covered in writing and the listeners will have an opportunity to make a vote. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the team that we could have assembled in the last eight years. And that team could still be playing today. So it's not as um, you know pie in the sky as the greatest ever Celtic team. There's a guy for the 60s and a guy from this era. This is a team that we could still have if we had a different business model business model being identify a talent who we can develop and sell at huge profit and we play that game extremely well if you had a team that could progress in the Champions League season on season you would make arguably as much as the money we've we've actually recouped in transfer fees right yep. so that's the argument if we didn't go down the three year route the three year plan and we kept the team together for seven or eight years so let's talk about the eight and a row team and we'll do it Starting off with a goalkeeper, Kevin Graham, who would make it between the sticks for you? Uh, our current goalkeeper, Fraser Foster. Obviously that's a bit a bit tough on Craig Gordon, but when you think back in the last eight years, Big, Big Foster's great night against Barcelona, when, when we got to the last 16 under Lenny, Fraser was fantastic. You didn't get any England call-ups now for any reason. The reason we, we Foster as well, we actually saw him develop for this sort of big giraffe type of goalkeeper into the keeper he became the keeper we actually got money money for I just think he's, he's been possibly the best goalkeeper I've seen watching Celtic definitely and I'm just actually quite glad that he's back to tell you the truth So he'd make your all time Celtic team that you've seen? Yes definitely mm-hmm. Aye. Mm-hmm. Colin would you agree with that? Yeah um, Fraser Foster's my goalkeeper my friends would want me to pick Scott Bain because I think Scott Bain's a great goalkeeper but no Fraser Foster's definitely the one um, over the eight and a eight in a row years he's, he's just so solid he's so reliable you knew when you were going to the likes of the new camp that he was going to put in a performance you just knew he was going to do something and he developed during his time here at Celtic I mean I think this is now he's signed for Celtic four times is that right two Three. loan deals a permanent deal and a third loan deal four mm-hmm. times he's signed so it shows that him working uh, with the goalkeeping coach at Celtic has developed him into a player and he grew, he was coming to collect balls where he didn't before, and you know that when you put him there, if you've got a solid back four in front of that, we will not concede a lot of goals. The first season he wouldn't come off his line, then yeah. by the second season that he worked, and I actually do think that he's back here now to get his confidence back, yeah. because after the last couple of years that he's had at Southampton, he knows this is a good place for him, he knows he's going to work with good coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Huge kudos to Stevie Woods, yeah. the fact that we're talking about top, top quality goalies. One of the best images of the treble, treble era will always be Gordon on his knees, the crowd erupting around about him, knowing that we've won an invincible treble. I understand where Kevin's coming from, but Foster got my choice as well. Us three in this room don't know what the other has picked until we announce it here. So, yeah, Foster is in goals for me. And again, here's a wee bit of trivia. You mentioned he signed four times. Has anyone ever signed for Celtic four times? Probably not. I don't think so. Okay, so he's in the record books for that. When I was looking at this, personally, I set it up as a 4-4-2, right? Because I wanted to play two up front, maybe giving a wee bit away there. So I have got a right back, and I felt that the right back position, it wasn't difficult to pick because we've not had many right backs. Probably the weakest position on the pitch for me. Yep. Kevin, who's playing right back? There's only one. It's a cult of Michael Lustig. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's got to be. And I can't say that you, you can say it's uh, the weakest. You're talking about a guy who's got numerous caps for Sweden, played in European Championships, played in World Cups. He's got a medals list that would knock at a horse. So, no, I can't see how it's the weakest. I can't see how it's the weakest. Maybe latter day Lustig, yes, but then he still went to Belgium and played at a decent level. I'll back your point up. I always thought that the right back position was something that we were very limited in. Lustig, on his day, was a fantastic player and he offered a, a solid option at right back. But going forward, getting across into the box wasn't always his strong point. At the back, he never had a lot of pace, so at times he get caught out. But at times he was your only option. Then who was going to come in and play at right back if Lustig didn't play? And that was also the case um, at left back for a long time with Emilio. Mm-hmm. 
if Emilio didn't play, who came through? And then it just came to the point where we gave the youth a chance and then came Kieran Dearney. Yeah, I'm saying it's the weakest in the, in the team. I would stick by that, but I take your point. He, he was a quality player. You know yeah. I liked uh, Lustig. Mm-hmm. I've picked him for right back. Who else are you going to pick? I mean, what other options have we got? Adam Matthews? Matthews done a decent job, right and left back. Don't mention Chad Hurry. <laughs> We're talking about Forster. The announcement for one of the deals, I don't know if it was a permanent one, it was the night of the Scion game. Remember the game? That we played against them, and he was murder. Chad Uri was murder that night. Sion, remember the, uh, the, the qualifier, and then they buggered up the registration and all the rest of it. Didn't get me wrong, I'm no slagging Lustigov. I just think we've got so much quality in this team. When I look at that, if I was an opposing manager, I'd still be targeting Lustig. I think Alan be Celtic with numbers would be able to shoot you, <laughs> shoot down Lustig's let's defensive. Get, <laughs> let's get his viewpoint, let's get it in here. Let's get, let's get him to follow this up with a wee article. So we're starting off with Foster and goals, Lustig. right back Mika Lustig, and left back. You mentioned already Emilio Izagiri. We've also got Kieran Tierney. Uh, we've got the current crop who are playing and plying their trade. Kevin Graham, who gets the number three shorts? Has to be Tierney. The reason being that he's a he's the best youth product that we've produced since Paul McSnay. The only one only youth product I reckon will go on to be elite level world class. And I Emilio was fantastic. The first before Emilio broke his leg, Emilio was absolutely unbelievable. Getting linked with that Man United, getting linked with big clubs. Mm-hmm. But I was there at Den's part that night where we when KT made his debut. And for him to go for that wee skinny guy to six months later being our first choice left back, playing, it was a Europa League tie. Can't remember who it was against in the Dyla era and we were terrible, but he was flying into challenges left, right and centre. And I remember leaving the, the stadium that night going, that boy's a player, that boy's got it. Rogers arrived, he built up, he developed and, and a, a f- tremendous athlete. And that's what's got him his move. And if he would have stayed with us, then he would still be that elite level player. I certainly Come think the, the early days for Kieran Tierney, um, and that's my choice as well, it was a lot of the fact that he didn't give up. He gave 100% to the jersey every single week, and it covered a lot of the fact that when he was coming through, he had a lot of weaknesses. Aye. He wasn't the complete player, and that's that's no shame on him. He was 17, 18 when he broke into the team, but there was a lot of weaknesses in that performances when he was coming through. Um, but remember, the fact remember John Sutton always gave him a good game? Yeah, targeted him in fact but it was easy to target him though mm-hmm. as Kevin was saying he was really skinny I mean we know that he was coping um, with his diabetes as well and he, he had the, the bottle of juice and the, the bar of chocolate at the side of the park he always went to it he wouldn't last the 90 minutes and he had a lot of weaknesses physically but he gave 100% of the jersey in a time where a lot of players didn't have that connection with the fans and he built that relationship up that let him away with the performances he had but as you're saying, when Rodgers came in, he grew, he developed as a player. And you're right, as much as I'm absolutely gutted that he's away and the way it happened to me didn't seem right, but he is, he's, he's a world-class talent. I also picked, I, I actually, I did love Emilio all the time. He was a, he was a great player pre-leg break and I just never thought he, he actually oh, yeah. got back to that standard. But Kieran Tierney, for me, he's a he's a definite at left back. Again, going to do a wee bit of name dropping. I was speaking to Danny McGrain recently. Danny McGrain believes we undersold him. He thought we should have got more than £25 million. Where can he go from Arsenal? Are we talking Real Madrid? I don't think so. I don't think he's got that potential to go to the likes of a Real Madrid or a... And it's not because of his talent, because I think he's a very talented person. But I, th- I think there's some underlying injury problems there that he's really got to go over. Otherwise, Arsenal might just be as far as he gets. I think Arsenal have got a game plan to develop a young side. When you look at their signings over the la- over the- this summer especially, and other players that they've already bought and sent back out on loan, I think Arsenal are looking to peak in about three or four years. And I think Arsenal could probably win the Premiership in three or four years with Tierney there. Bold statement yeah. from Kevin Graham. Right, two centre halves. We'll move on. Kevin, who's your first centre half? First one is Van Dyke. The man was a Rolls Royce as soon as we saw him that day at Pataudry. You know that that term. First time I heard that Rolls Royce term was Paul Gallagher on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Can we change it? Can he be a a, a different vintage car? Yeah, a Bentley. He's a Bentley. <laughs> Van Dyke's a Bentley. That day when he made his debut at Pataudry, he came on last on for the last twenty minutes. The sobby's physicality, his height, he knew he was good on the ball, first couple of touches. Then he had a shocker against Caragandi on, mm-hmm. the, on the Wednesday night after it, and he was dropped for the return leg against Caragandi. But as time went on with, with Virgil, 
you just saw him getting better and better. As soon as he got the handle of the Scottish game, handle of the, the physical nature and some of the, the things that the referee gives a blind eye to, he, he squished Scottish football. Oh. <laughs> he absolutely squished Scottish football. Always remember the goal that he scored in Perth mm. when he just decided to take the ball for a run. It was like one of the guys in a, in a playground who was far better than everybody else going, I'm just going to take this and, and stroke this into the If back you're not going to do it, I'll just do it. Aye. Aye. And again, I remember speaking to people at, at the time and I'm going, after that 20 minutes at Pataudry, I, I turned into the guy I was sitting next to Davy Feeks and I went like, you're not holding on to him. <laughs> it was my first, just because he had it all. And what you've got to remember as well, we spent quite a bit of money on Van Dyke at that time. Who else was in from Com? Ajax. 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 So it was over two million we spent on him at that time mm-hmm. with a guy who had played under 60 games for Groenigan. We wouldn't get a Van Dyke now. Yeah. A Van Dyke w- would not come to Scottish football now with the exact same upturn that he's had. What you're looking at in the shape of a Van Dyke now is what we have in Christopher Julian. Mm-hmm. It's someone that is potentially underappreciated in the league that he was in. He's a bit older, but he's come here with a point to prove, knowing that Celtic is a stepping stone for him, and if the, he has those performances, he will get the move now to the Premiership, which will probably be, at his age, his last big move. As long as he doesn't come up against Dykes of Livingston. Now, Colin, I'm guessing you've also picked Virgil. I've picked Virgil. It is a simple choice. He's, he's now the, the second best player in the world. Um, and you could see that from day one. You could see he was far too good for this league. I don't think he ever broke sweat in the, the Scottish Premiership. He was always so comfortable. But at times, that was his downfall as well. Um, I remember going away to Inter Milan in the last mm-hmm. 32 of the year for Cup. Mm. And that was just because he couldn't find that switch to go from I'm, I'm strolling games to I really need to put a, a performance in here. Um, and that's sometimes what cost him. And I think that's why he didn't move straight to an Arsenal or a Tottenham or a Liverpool from Celtic, he had to go Even and make he that. Was good enough. Exactly, mm-hmm. he had to make that transition at Southampton. Mm-hmm. I've also picked him unsurprisingly. I mean, we go back to the discussion I had with Neil Lennon, Kevin. You were there, and Lenny said the first day of training he could have played anywhere on the park, mm-hmm. anywhere. And he wasn't actually sure. He turned into, I think it was me, Albie, and said to him, "Is he a midfielder?" Just the way he was playing the game. So yes, I've looked at this team. You two have probably done the same. Are you picking just an individual? Are you actually thinking who would be the best blend with Van Dyke? I've put a partnership together. Partnership, Kevin. Partnership. partnership. So who's playing alongside Virgil? Jason Denier. That's a good shout because I've always been a big fan of Jason Denier. I haven't picked him actually, but aye, talk to us about Jason Denier. Virgil van Dijk and Jason Denier were the best partnership I've seen at Celtic since, since Martin, Caldwell. Caldwell and McManus. McManus. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, since Martin O'Neill, the, the Martin O'Neill partnership with Baldy and Min- 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 Albi. They two perfectly complemented themselves. Denier was quicker actually in Van Dyke. He looked more, he, he looked more athletic, more rangy in Van Dyke. They scored quite a f- amount of goals. Denier scored quite a lot yeah. of goals for us, mm. and he's won. You're talking about players that got away. He could have had a stellar career, career with us. His, his career, no, he's at Leon actually. He's oh, out, so he's, he's, he's playing with Leon. Eh? Maybe he's earned far more money going to Turkey and, and France, but his career hasn't went where I thought it was going to go when he left Celtic. I thought he was going to go to the top of the game. Mind you, that's having Sunderland on your CV. That seems to be... Uh, that seems to be a... a Sorry, a, Jack Ross. That, that seems to be a knockback for anybody if you get Sunderland on your CV. But for me, he was a great centre. I have great partnership with Van Dyke, And for, in the last eight years, with they two, I thought they're the most solid that we've looked Interesting. In, in the last eight years. See, I was, I was between three... And I think I've picked the most controversial out of the three. So I'll tell you the three. The three were Christopher Ayer, who I think is not only a player that's a solid part of the team now, but he's going to develop over the next few years and he's going to be fantastic. Dedrick Boyata, who I thought was criminally undervalued at Celtic, and you could see why he was ready to make the moves. But the controversial choice I've went for the partnership is a bit out uh, out of the box. I've went with near beat on at centre-half. Oh, dear. <laughs> Oh. Near beat on alongside Virgil van Dijk I just think Virgil van Dijk uh, was always a classy player on the ball But he could defend and he knew when to put the tackle in Beat on would have been the player that was sitting behind him That would pick it all up And the two of them in the air I've never seen beat on lose a ball in the air I think he's fantastic I just go back to near beat on against Astana 
and when we were five nothing up for the first leg, and he had a seventeen minutes where we lost three goals, and he was everywhere par where he should have been. That that just sticks in my head. Uh, sometimes, the, I mean, don't get me wrong, his, his performances aren't always the the best, but he's not getting into the midfield of my team. He plays at centre half for me, and that's where I've, I've put him in because he's over the last eight years, what a consistent performer for Celtic. I think this is an interesting it's an interesting choice because I haven't picked Denier or Beaton. Denier was on my, my shortlist because I thought, as Kevin rightly states, it's been a fantastic partnership. I've heard the arguments about he only looked good because of Van Dyke making him look good and all this carry on. I thought they were a great partnership. I haven't chosen him, I've chosen Boyata. And again, maybe for his own his own individual ability. And I just think that as a partnership they could have they could have developed a real understanding, Van Dyke and Boyata. And I think Boyata is going to go on and prove that international level as he is he's currently doing. You know, we're the best international team in the world as it currently stands. And he was a nine, ten million pound player because that's how much teams were willing to pay for him. It is it's going to be one of the discussion points. We can't come to a, a conclusion between the three of us. Maybe some of the listeners will uh, add their own opinions into that. Maybe Alan, Celtic by numbers, will give us some numbers that will sway us towards maybe Kevin calling on myself. So I've gone for Van Dyke and Boyata. Well, here's one for you. So as we go through this list, take a note of the amount of players that play for France, Belgium or Holland that are going to be in this side because that is the region that Celtic seem to have scouted out so well over the last eight years and the amount of players from that region that are coming into the side um, or could be considered for the side is actually quite frightening. Mm-hmm. The other player that I would mention because I thought that at various times that he was going to be an outstanding centre half for us was Big Jozo. I thought mm. a few times mm-hmm. Simunovic was going to be the answer. I no longer feel that he is going to be the answer. I don't know if that's down to injuries or he's just maybe not developing the way you kind of thought he would. But a couple of times I thought he's going to be fantastic for Celtic at centre half. He's going to have a great partnership. I also agree with you calling about Ayer, a huge fan of uh, Chris Ayer. Um, we're looking at a player who is three or four years younger than what the Van Dyke was that we, we were introduced yep. to. I think he can go into some incredible uh, success as a, as a football player. Right, middle of the park, what are we going for? Are we going? Let's, let's ask you, is everybody playing two up front? No. No. No? You used to play one up front? Yeah. Well, I'm Difficult choice. I'm 4-3-3. Four, three, three. Four three three Come four on. two three one. What we play right now? Okay. Well, we're all playing different uh, formations. Are we all playing with a right and a left? Yes. Right. So we'll start with the right, Kevin. Right. I'm 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 playing with a three, and it's a sort of diamond three. So if if you're talking about on the right hand side of my team, I'm going to get this wrong. It would be James Forrest. Okay. But, but he's actually one of my three up front. But it would be James Forrest. Yeah. Forrest as well, he's got he's got the pace, he's got the trickery, he scares defences. Great outball in Europe when he's on his game and also he can score goals. He, he, he chips in with important goals every time, every season. I mentioned Karagandi, he scored, he scored that goal against Karagandi as well. I think he's developed into a fantastic player and one that's probably going to be here for the duration of his career. So I would have James Forrest every day of the week on the right-hand side. It's James Forrest for me as well, and it's exactly what Kevin said. He's just over the last couple of years, he's just become Mister Reliable. He just he chips in with it. He's added the goals to the game because he never really had the no. goals to be, to begin with. But I think over the last like three or four seasons, he scored close to sixty goals. His development since Brendan Rodgers came in was outstanding because there was a time under Ronnie Dyla where we thought that we were going to lose him. Mm-hmm. His contract was just going to run out and he wasn't going to sign a new deal. But certainly over the last three years, James Forrest has been one of my favourite players to watch because. He has, he's just been getting at players, he's been getting at teams. I mean, St Johnston last season was just outstanding. What a performance that was. It was outstanding and he's getting a, a game at, uh, on the right for me as well. The other centre-half, just darting back to that, that I've written down, Spenkovic, simply because of how good he is, but he never played enough games, no. so he couldn't be quoted. But I would mention him as in terms of the quality of that player and I think he will go into great things as well. Forrest, I thought he was a stick-on first name on the team sheet almost for me. And it would be fantastic if he did remain for his entire career because we thought we had three in McGregor, Forrest and Tierney that may have done that and unfortunately that's not worked out. Would you play, we're talking left side then, Kevin, have you got someone that could be implemented on the left side? Paddy Roberts, definitely one of the best Celtic players I've seen in my time. 
Uh, again, a bit like Denier, his career hasn't really went where I saw it going after he left us. And, I mean, he could have been a permanent Celtic player if Man City hadn't changed the goalposts when, after his last loan move had ended. He's a man that you would struggle to get the ball off Paddy Roberts, a beach ball off Paddy Roberts in a phone box. He can open up defences. He, he scored great goals. Again, he's just one of the players that you you would pay to watch, but also he's a talent. He would make a difference on a European stage, not just domestically. He would make a difference on a European and stage. That's what we're talking about. And again, he went to Spain. He was injured for a spell in Spain. Then played quite a few games where he got man in a match and that, but then disappeared again. Eh? Well, I think the problem you've got there is the same problem that Denier has. Is they went for the big move far too young in their career. I mean. I suppose that you could say his big move was to Man City and, he ended, and that was the only reason he ended at Celtic mm-hmm. but if you look at the likes of Van Dyke, they took two or three seasons they mm-hmm. grew as players to then get that move whereas Denier just he's now got his move to Lyon is, that, is he going to be doing well there? I don't know I don't keep up with French football Roberts you're right he should have made so much more of his career by this point and I think he would have done it if he stayed at Celtic Definitely I've also got young Patrick Roberts and uh, I just think he is one of the best players in terms of a Celtic style if, you, if you're going for a vintage a quintessential entertaining type player who can take on a man and get you on the edge of your seats Paddy Roberts is that player I've got to say I, di- I didn't actually go for Roberts um, as much as if my girlfriend's listening to us she knows how much I love Paddy Roberts they get a picture taken together and I've cropped out her face <laughs> and I've kept Paddy Roberts um, I've went for Odson Edward I've went for Odson Edward on the left because I think he's not your traditional centre forward I don't think that he's as effective playing as a lone striker which I've only got one lone striker but coming off the left and pairing up with someone um, if we'd got a season of him and Dembele linking up together Oh, that would have been the best football we could have seen for a long time. Dynamite. I think we, you're, what you're saying about Edward was was there when you looked at pre-season last season. Rogers played a three-five-two because he wanted to pair Dembele yeah. and Edward together. We we missed it there. That would <laughs> we, we definitely missed it. I know we'll come back to this maybe at the end, but I would mention Sinclair, right? I would mention him in terms of yeah. what he looked as though he could do in, in his first season. It's not kind of transpired over the last season and a half or so, but Sinclair deserves a mention. But although he's not on the team, mention. he's not definitely centre mid. First central midfielder. I thought this was again quite a difficult one because you're looking for a blend. Scott Brown. <laughs> it goes it goes if it's Captain Fantastic. Um, you have a look at him over the last couple of years, even at European level, he puts the fit in, he does the dirty job. And um I Celtic wouldn't have achieved what they've achieved in the last couple of seasons if it wasn't if it's Scott Brown. You got someone playing alongside him? Yes. Let's talk about that before I move on to Colin. Wanyama. Brown and Wanyama. See, I've got Brown and Wanyama sitting as well. How, how could you not have Wanyama on the side? He was just, he was a monster. Absolute monster. And if you look back at the game against Barcelona, he strolls the game as well. We're struggling to sit. We're sitting so deep in that game. Wanyama doesn't look out of place. He could have put the, the blue and red jersey on him that night and he would have just fit in. He was fantastic. No, as controversial as beat on, but I've not actually chosen Scott Brown. I've got one Yama and McGregor, and you might see that's maybe no McGregor's best position and all the rest of it. But I love Scott Brown. I've written a number of articles for the Celtic State of Mind. I'm a massive fan. I know that we have relied on him for massive parts of this eight in a row campaign. I would have McGregor and one Yama. I can see why McGregor mm-hmm. certainly offers that option going box to box, and as the eight in a row years went on. Brown's sat a lot deeper and at times you could say he slowed the game down but the thing about Scott Brown over the last eight years is every time someone's written him off whether it be the Celtic fans or anyone else he's went out he's worked hard he's proved them wrong and he's become absolutely influential within the centre of that midfield I totally agree with you I totally agree with you and again I didn't want this sounding like I'm not a Scott Brown fan because I'm a massive Scott Brown fan you know one of the biggest aspects is goals I was looking at his goals record I think he scored 60 odd goals in 540 games or something like that and from that position, I'd be looking at McGregor to chip in with more goals. And he won the league at Rugby Park last season. I've got McGregor in my free. I've got McGregor because you're talking about difference at European level when you're playing different when you're playing a step up for domestic. So you would need maybe two coverers. That's how you've got one Yama and Brown, and you've got McGregor who hardly ever gives the ball away. And at a European level, yep. that's what you need. You yep. can't give the ball away at Europe and European level. I've got to say, McGregor didn't make my team. It was he was on the subs bench, and I'll tell you who played in the forward row because I'm playing four two three one. Right, so we've both got two players left. The three of us have got two players left. 
and her team. I'm playing two up front. Kevin, are you playing with a number 10 and somebody up front? I'm actually a player short. No, I'm actually a player <laughs> <laughs> I picked 12, get a fix 10. Run, run. We'll get there somehow. No, I've got 11. I've only got one left. I've only got, because I've already says, ah, I've, I'm, I'm playing a 4-3-3. Three. Three. Oh, you've already mentioned McGregor, that's uh, what it is. So you've, uh, you've still got your forward. I've still got my forward. Right, who is it? Dembele. That so guy. Edward doesn't make your cut? No, not at this precise moment in time, okay. no. But Dembele, for me, more physical aspect at his peak. Well, I know he hasn't peaked it, but he had the more physical aspect in Europe. He had pace. He had everything that you wanted in a modern-day centre-forward. It was close between him and Edward. Edward now is getting there. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the two seasons that we had at had a Dembele where he completely smashed it. You can't see anybody else apart from Mr Dembele. Colin, so you've, still, you've got, still got two. Give us the two players that you're playing. So, behind the striker, I've got Joe Ledley. Um, Joe Ledley, I think to me, was such an undervalued player, um, especially during Neil Lennon's first term. And he just, he was the engine in the middle of the park. And going between box to box, it was very close between him and McGregor. Um, I think over the period of time, we'll, we'll look and see that McGregor has offered more but Ledley was just that class player. And I think it wasn't until we we lost Ledley out the side that we realised what we had. Um, and I'll always remember him scoring to put us top of the league um, in the game against Rangers at, at Parkhead that I think time. he was shabbily treated uh, yeah. when he left as well. And I've actually got Ledley as one that I wanted to mention as well because, I, like you, we should never have got Joe, Le- Joe Ledley at the time when, no. we, when we got him. Eh? And he was a top quality player who came to us at the peak of his powers. Aye. And, he's, and he loves us. I think his dad still watches, come, comes up to watch Celtic. I think Cardiff had refused a, a couple of bids of £6-7 million pound ah, for him, yeah. um, leading up to the, the time where we were able to get him, not on a free transfer, but out of contract. Aye. So you're probably right, we probably at that time wouldn't have shelled that kind of money out. No. And uh, up top... Oh, Musa. So you've him. managed to get Edward and Musa, but I've just not as that... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're looking for goals, you've got them two together. Not playing in the same formation, but oh, Dembele. I mean, I can't believe there was actually a time when we went into the, the game, the, what became the Joey Barton Old Firm game at mm. Celtic Park. I know. Where <laughs> you want to call it the, the Joey Barton Derby game? Sorry, we'll rephrase <laughs> that. The Joey Barton Glasgow Derby, where we actually thought, oh, Griffiths is missing this game. We've got to play Dembele up front, and what a game. That is one of the best games I've ever seen. It was so, so good. He's a special, special player, and the way I've basically shape my team is to have Eduard and Dembele up front together I just think that you know that combination uh, with Eduard being almost like not an apprentice but you know he could learn a hell of a lot from uh, Dembele and what I loved about Dembele which I didn't think it was commented on all that often was his incredible defensive qualities definitely the headers the amount of time you saw him winning a header in his own box uh, you know, so Dembele and Erdo, I just thought would have been a frightening prospect for any t- team in Europe. Well, here's a here's a supporting act for the the Edward um, playing on the left and Dembele up front. Go back to the Glasgow derby at Ibrox. We were down to ten men, Dembele and if you look at that goal. that goal, Edward plays off the left for this the from when he comes on, and the two the, the link up play for the winning goals just oh unbelievable. Dynamite. It's almost it's like synchronicity. Mm. You know what I mean? When there's, there's so much understanding between players that it's, it's sim, it seems simple. That one will play there. I was, again, talking about uh, players that, that did that, um, you know, very, very well. Dalgleish and McGrain, mm. for example, there was just this... It wasn't telepathic, of course it wasn't, but there was an understanding between the two. And I think we had the same way, Eduard and Dembele. We've not agreed on a team, but some of the names we've been talking about, anybody else who didn't make the cut that you have written down on your list? Right, so I've got a subs bench. I'll go through it quickly. Craig Gordon, Dedrick Boyata, both players we've talked about. George Samaras. He's got to get in there somewhere. <laughs> Samaras was, oh, Samaras was on his day a world class player, and on another day didn't know how to play football. That season that we qualified for the last sixteen, Samaras was fantastic. No, no team in Europe could handle him. No. Nobody could take a ball on his chest like no. him. It no. could be a, a, a sixty yard punt, and it just died on his chest. Referring back to Glasgow derbies, any time you watched them at Celtic Park, they would go nowhere near him because they didn't know how to handle him. And on the European stage. In a games against Rangers, he was alive to that, wasn't he? Oh, Definitely. fantastic. So adding on to Samaras, you've got to have Lee Griffiths in there for the amount of goals that he scored during that period. Uh, Callum McGregor, Chris Commons. Chris Commons as well was another very influential player. Um, and finally, Gary Hooper. Gary Hooper's one of the best natural-born finishers I've seen in my time at Celtic Park. Put that ball in the box and he knows where the goal is. Kevin, Timo Pukki? No. 
<laughs> unfortunately not. Quite a lot of the players that Collins got on his bench, I've also got written down. It wasn't a sub bench I've got, it's just mentions, eh? So, Ki Sung Young, I oh. loved him. He was a fan, he, great football Remember player. Just call that him Dave. Ginger, that ginger red kind uh, of tinge in his hair, that was bizarre. Uh, just call him Dave. Stefan Johansson. Was not a massive fan, personally. Uh, uh, his energy. Oh, he, he, was, he, he, was, he was like a wee Duracell bunny. Stuart Armstrong. Yep. For a period as well. Mm-hmm. And you have to go for Tom Roddick as well. Tom Roddick is, is one of them ones, I think the longer he's out of the team, the more you clamour for him to get back into it. And he'll give you six or seven fantastic games and then he disappears for so long or he'll get injured. He's, his career's been dampened so much with the injuries that he's went through. And I think it's a lot to do with the fact that he's travelling out to Australia six, seven times a year and coming back and then you'd expect him to play I on Saturday. I... Kevin, you've also got a list of guys you'd rather forget. Is Mika on it? No, he isn't. No. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan Skepovic. Oh. His dad played for Partizan Belgrade against us in that 5-4 game. Mo Bangura. We signed the wrong Bangura. One of the worst players I've ever seen in a Celtic jersey. El Kaduri. He scored at Ibrox. He did, that was a weird signing. <laughs> but we got beat. That we did. We got hammered. Moving on. And Efren Juarez. Within four or five games, he was a world beater. And then the prostitutes came into it. You want to just fire names about? <laughs> Lasad. Right. Miku. Uh, Did I say Mika? No, he says Miku. Did I? Olivier Capo. Freddie Lundberg. Capo. Who's the wee guy? Pro- we Brozek. Oh. Brozek. Pavel yeah. Brozek. Any third choice goalkeeper we signed under Neil Lennon, mm-hmm. who then went on to play for Dundee United and was hopeless. We could we could do a podcast just on that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of misses, even though we do sign players well, but... Sometimes we've went through an awful lot of players who never looked up to it. We've and kissed a lot of frogs, mate, I'll yeah. tell you that much. But I mean, when we look at the teams, the point of this was perhaps had we had a different vision and we'd kept the crop of them, the cream of the crop, what would a team like that actually do in Europe? Do you think that's enough? Because we spoke about you know, getting knocked out of, let's say, the last 32 and or getting through to the, the, the last 16, even in the Europa League. How much money are we talking in terms of investment in a, in a squad? We're talking two, three hundred million pounds. It's not, never going to happen. But every so often, there's a blend of a, a group of players that might do it. And we saw it, obviously, fairly recently with Ajax, even though they do spend money. The teams that we're talking about, the players that we've sold, probably to the region of 70, 80 million pounds, had we kept them together, could they have done any better than what we've done in the last eight years? I think there's a ceiling that you reach because we play in Scotland hmm. I think there's a ceiling that, that, that we do reach and possibly depending on a favourable draw our ceiling's always going to be the last 16 or of both competitions just because we play in Scotland I don't know I think I think we need to look at the fact that we're probably not in this climate a Champions League team anymore we're not we clamour to get to the group stages but the way that every time we get to the group stages we're getting it for the money we're not getting it for the fact that we're going to compete because we don't really compete, because we end up getting a draw against all these big teams that we've played before, and we do, we get we get turned over. But I think, honestly, if we put a lot of effort and we got these teams into the Europa League, there's nothing stopping us being a Salzburg that gets to a semi-final, or could get to a final. Celtic have got to understand that we've got to bring this mentality um, that we had under the Martin O'Neill era, where we make Celtic Park a fortress, teams should be scared of coming to play us and we've just got to work hard and keep that winning mentality going when we go away from home and we will, we can get the results. For everyone listening to this podcast, tell us if we've forgotten any star names that you'd have picked in your team and Colin will be running a poll when we get round to the the 2010s uh, of your team of the decade. Thanks for listening and subscribe now to A Celtic State of Mind. 